everybody wherever you are out there in the world. And I'd like to welcome you to Watermelon Wednesdays. And this is Watermelon Wednesdays interview with the artist. This is our first interview ever. Well done. And starting out, it's a very high bar. Um, but uh, we'll, we'll get over it uh, eventually anyway. Um, I'd like to introduce the artist of the hour, Tim Cliphouse. Tim is, I would say, in my opinion, probably the world's leading proponent of Django Jazz or Gypsy Jazz. He won't deny it. He's a very humble man. I'm not so much saying that. that. Thank you. <laughs> anyway, um, so I wanted to do these interviews to give you all, the audience, an idea of what, what goes on behind the music, what, what moves the musician, and what moves and how the musicians move the music. So I want to ask Tim a few questions about the music. First of all, what kind of music is this? Well, uh, it's a hybrid that we're going to play. Uh, both Fiona and I are based in uh, classical music, steeped in it actually, and uh, I, somewhat later than Fiona, discovered the music of Django Reinhardt and Stefan Copelli later, when I was already a classical violinist. Um, so a gypsy jazz, as it's called nowadays, the music of Django Reinhardt, um, is a big part of what I do, and it's kind of shaped my improvisation. But I have Celtic interests as well. I've listened a lot to Irish and Scottish music. I have many friends in that genre as well. So actually, I would say it's a hybrid of gypsy jazz, Celtic and classical. And what would you call it? I don't know, just the music. Of course. So, But with particular uh, about gypsy jazz, what is it that makes gypsy jazz unique? Or Well, gypsy jazz is actually defined more by its lineup that by the instrumentation than anything else. Oh. And the instrumentation that was so new in the 1930s when it was developed in Paris was uh, purely string instruments, so violin, guitar, and double bass. And until then, jazz had always had either drums or wind players or piano, and those were all not there. So that was quite revolutionary. But what those two guys back in Paris, Django and Stefan, tried to do was play American jazz. So they were actually trying to mimic what the Paul Whiteman Orchestra, what Eddie Lang, what Joe Venuti, and what Louis Armstrong were doing. Hmm. And yes, they had a typically French approach, but that was because they were listening to the odd record from America and they were playing with French dance bands. So there is a European influence on the American jazz with a lineup that is particularly gypsy jazz, that's only in that style. In no other style will you find violin, guitar, and bass. So, so what are some of the musical elements that are um, maybe not particularly gypsy jazz, but included in gypsy jazz that make it so aff affective? Well, actually, I would say the same for swing jazz, or that so. it's uh, really good tunes. Uh, <laughs> that, of course, some of them are the, the legendary tunes from the Tin Pan Alley days from the yeah. 20s, 30s, 40s, Gershwin. Jerome Kern, Rogers and Hart, Irving Berlin. Um, and of course, those tunes, most of them were Jewish composers. Yeah. So there's more Jewish music in jazz than people sometimes uh -huh. uh, think about. Um, and then, of course, there's the blues element, which is uh, from the Deep South, which was part of the development of jazz as well, of course. Yeah. But then there's also the European dance band element, which is actually waltzes and polkas and things like that. And actually what Django Reinhardt was doing was he was mixing the French waltzes, the musette waltzes, in with the jazz. So he actually did create more of a broad repertoire than only the swing jazz repertoire. So could you play a phrase or two of that would be that would be characteristic of say swing versus Maybe some of the Tin Pan Alleys. Well, I realize there's a lot of overlap there, but I'm trying to get it up. Uh, you know, signature sounds. Of yeah. Well, if you look at uh, Tin Pan Alley tunes, things like uh, Embrace Will You. Typical Gershwin, beautiful Gershwin composition. Um, Django Reinhardt wrote some beautiful tunes as well. And they're a bit more Ravel, they're a bit more French. And actually I would say they're more chromatic, they're more 
impressionist, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, and if you look at swing tunes, like maybe take Gershwin's Lady Be Good, and uh, then you take a Django swing tune, that's very different. It's met more arpeggio and, and chord based. It's like uh, this thing's called Djangology. And in contrast to the old Tim Pan Am songs, which were composed for the musicals, mm -hmm. actually for classical singers, classical orchestras. So there was not very much syncopation, there was not very much swing in them. So in the 1930s, the small bands, people like Benny Goodman and those guys, they put swing into them, but they were not actually swing tunes. And what you see with, with the comp compositions that get made in the 30s and 40s by swing and gypsy jazz artists, they're actually written for the small band. So they have syncopation built in. So, it seems to me, as soon as you start playing Embrace the Review or, or uh, Lady Be Good, right away my foot starts to tap. There's yeah. something about what's going on musically that's rhythmically driving it and that, it, that affects the listener to want to move and, you know, I'm not sure what that is. How well, the original it? would be written for a, a classical singer who would sing more like this. And so if you make that a bit shorter and a bit more danceable, it's of course dance music we're talking about, it comes from the dance halls. And then the, the player actually feels the pulse. And these are the dance steps, these are the quicks. So slow, slow, quick, quick, slow. And if you feel the quicks, and then you get this rhythmic syncopation around the ba ba -da -da. Which is where the kicks and the strange swing dance tricks that people have, like rock steps and stuff, that comes in when you start syncopating. So the syncopation was not there in the George Bush. And the syncopation means what exactly? When you say syncopation is when you play round a beat. These are the beats. That's your pulse. That's your walk, basically, your dance walk. And if you go against that, ba, 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 da, ba, ba, against the beat. That's where you start uh, suggesting that the, the music, the bar or the pulse could be somewhere else. So it throws people. Yeah. And the throwing people actually, because you don't really throw them indefinitely, you quickly come back to the pulse. That gives them a little jolt and that probably makes their foot go up. And down. Yeah, okay, okay. It's a, a rhythmic energy that you give to the thing. That's great. So getting back to your classical training, what about, your cla what about the music that you, you switched over to? What was it that you know, generated that switch on your part. I always wanted to improvise, but I just didn't have a means of doing that on the violin. And I, I felt, whenever I tried it, I felt it sounded really bad. So uh, I, I kind of gave up. But then when I was 19, I got this CD, and Stefan Rappelli was on it with Errol Garner and uh, another pianist from England, Alan Clare. So they were recorded from the 70s, 80s. And I just thought, wow, so it is possible to improvise on the violin and sound really, really good. So I thought, well, I'll have to learn this then. But doesn't classical have improvisation? I mean, they have cadences, right? In classical had improvisa improvisation until 1900. And in the 20th century, things got very much ossified. So publishers published the score, and even the cadence of the improvised bit oh. in the middle of the score would still be written out by somebody. And people specialized in being really good but not creative. So the creativity actually disappeared. And that was also an effect of the recording industry that wanted clear-cut recordings. You know, we do Sibelius violin concerto, and people know exactly what they're going to get. But for this time, I sell uh, person X. And then the next month, I sell person Y. And they'll buy both, because people like things they recognize. Yeah. But of course, they like even more. But that's not a commercial uh, thing. But a lot of people like even more if it's very different. So your jazz people subverted the whole thing? Actually, jazz became ossified as well ah. because of the recording industry and because of conservatoires. Mm -hmm. But we're seeing since the year 2005, 6, I've seen things just shift. And I'm now teaching improvisation at the Conservatoire of Amsterdam, at the Royal Conservatoire of The Hague. So the two top Dutch conservatoires have actually got somebody in All right, teaching improvisation to their classical guys, to their classical students. And creativity is going to be so much more important for the classical world coming decades because actually people don't want to go to the same thing six times anymore. Well, I'd like to thank you very much for bringing that uh, 
that feeling and sentiment into the classical world. And it has I, to be done. I'd also like to thank you very much, Tim, for playing at Watermelon Wednesdays. It's a great pleasure being here. Taking some time to talk to me about the music. You're very welcome. Thank you very much. And thank you, FCAT viewers and beyond.